Please take a seat. Good to see you all. Very good morning. You feeling refreshed after an extra hour in bed? You can tell young people, because if you're a young person, you thought to yourself, oh great, I can stay up an hour later last night. If you're old like me, you think, oh hallelujah, an extra hour. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Jesus, strong and kind. We do thank you for the rock-like security of faith in him because of who he is and what he has done. Uh, please, Lord, will you strengthen our faith as we look at your word together now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our reading from this letter, the letter to the Galatians, we've come to a very personal and painful passage. And it reminds us, perhaps some of us, of dilemmas that we faced in our own family. I apologize if, if, if the memory is painful to you, but uh, I, I know how you feel. When you see a member of your family, perhaps close family, clearly going astray, going off the rails, what do you do? What, what do you do? On the one hand, you might think to yourself, well, you know, they're grown-ups, uh, if they are. Um, They've got to make their own life. They've got to make their own decisions. I hope that they'll come to their senses, but, you know, there's nothing I can do about it, really. Or should we agonize and plead with them? Should we beg them to turn back before it's too late? They know the right way. Follow it. Well, for Paul there was a similar agonizing dilemma and he chose the option of pleading right at the heart of our reading. He, he, he says this, brothers, I entreat you, I beg you. Brothers meaning members of God's family. He's, he's putting himself on their level uh, because that's what he is and that's what they are sons and daughters of the living God through faith in Christ Jesus. And he's begging them to turn back to the right path. Just to remind ourselves who these Galatians were, uh, Galatia was a, a region, not just one town or city, but a, but a whole region in what we now call Turkey, modern Turkey. And in that region, there were lots of new little Christian communities springing up. And they were springing up because of the work that Paul had done, because he'd taken the good news of Jesus Christ to them. And we'll see more about that later on. And they had responded so well. They had, had responded with joy to the message, to the good news of Jesus. And that's why the, the churches had sprung up. And... Uh, now Paul is very worried about them. He's deeply concerned about reports that he's hearing from Galatia. Because it seems that there's been a deputation from Jerusalem that a, a number of the prominent Jews in Jerusalem had in fact decided that Jesus was probably the Messiah. And therefore they'd started to follow Jesus. Jesus, of course, uh, had gone back to heaven some time before all this. But these prominent Jews would still worship in the temple in Jerusalem day by day. The temple was still there, had not yet been destroyed by the Romans, although that was soon to come. And they would still live their, their lives under the law of Moses because they always had done. So far, so understandable. But they felt that what was good enough for them should be good enough for anyone who followed Jesus Christ. 
and they imagined that the life they lived was the way to be a Christian, the only way. And they began to hear of people turning to Christ out in the sticks, out in the wilds, out in Galatia of all places. And surely these people need to learn about the law of Moses. Surely these people, if they're following Jesus, need to lead the life that Jesus lived, or at least uh, that Jesus' parents and family lived. Remember, they had Jesus circumcised. They kept every uh, dot and comma of the law. And Jesus never, ever spoke against the law of God. And so you can see how their thinking was going. And so off they went to Galatia. It was quite a journey in those days. But they were on a mission. They were on a mission to put these uncivilized Gentiles on the right track. And um, as they saw it, they were there to explain the implications of the gospel that the Galatians had believed. And it would go something like this. Well, of course, faith in Jesus Christ is very important, very important. And we do believe that he was the Messiah. But, of course, the Messiah is the, the Jewish leader. And Jesus was a Jew, and his family were Jews. And, um, you know, we, we, must, we must reflect that in the way we, we, we live our lives. If we want to please God, if we want to be acceptable to God, for a start, all Christian men should be circumcised. After all, Jesus was. And then we'll explain to you other aspects of the law of Moses that you really should be keeping if you want to please God, if you want to be acceptable to him. The Apostle Paul was utterly horrified when he heard of their mission. And we, we could ask, well, why? Because after all, Paul himself was an alpha male Jew. He was at the top of the tree. His Jewish CV was impeccable. He called himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was steeped in the Old Testament. But the difference was that Paul had had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus had sent him as an apostle to the Gentiles. And he knew from experience, Paul knew from experience, that the Old Testament law, good though it was in itself, couldn't save anyone. Because believe Paul, he had tried. He had tried ticking every box. He had tried dotting every I and crossing every T. And he knew you could not get to God that way, however hard you tried. And he had tried. He knew from experience that the law of God condemns us. The law of God is good and perfect, and we are very much not. And so the law of God in itself can never get us to God, quite the opposite. Because we all break it. Only Jesus kept it perfectly. And this is where they made their big mistake, wasn't it? They didn't see that Jesus had kept the law so they could be forgiven for breaking it. They didn't see that Jesus had taken their condemnation when he died upon the cross. This was the great news that Paul had taken to the Gentiles. You don't need to go down that route. Jesus has set you free. So we can only be saved from condemnation by faith in him. And, said Paul, if we add even one law to that, we lose it. That's why Paul was pleading with the Christians in Galatia. And his plea falls into two parts, two headlines. Stay free, he said, and stay faithful. Firstly, stay free. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. You see, the Gentiles weren't without religion. Oh, no, they were awash with religion. They had religion coming out of their ears. There was religions of this and religions of that. There were mystery cults. There was official Roman, um, the Roman Empire uh, where you had to worship Caesar. There were religions all around them. And they were enslaved. They were utterly enslaved to these religions. Very, very demanding Woe betide you if you didn't keep all the rules and regulations. Very superstitious. And slavery. 
Paul, that's how Paul described it, and that's what it was. And, of course, God didn't create that slavery. God wants men and women to know him. That's how Paul starts. You did not know God. Tragic. Instead, you had religion, which is no sort of substitute at all. And without God, we are all enslaved. Without the knowledge of God, we're enslaved one way or another. Jews and Gentiles, religious or non-religious. Think of some of the modern slaveries that our world offers us. Slavery to consumption. The slavery of a consumer society. Wage slavery. Got to earn more and more and more and more. Slavery to tyrannical regimes which cause havoc in the world. In one way or another, we're all enslaved. We're all born into slavery and we will all live and die in it unless we're set free by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the great news that Paul brought to the Galatians. No wonder that initially they accepted it with great joy. Now that you've come to know God or rather be known by God, they had a direct relationship with the Lord God through the Lord Jesus Christ. No need for religion anymore. We can be free because of what Jesus did for us. And without that, we are slaves. Jesus said himself, if the Son makes you free, the Son of God and the Son of Man, Jesus himself, you will be free indeed. And once you're free, why would you ever go back to slavery? Jesus uh, scandalized the religious leaders of his day by saying, you're still enslaved. We've never been slaves. You are, you know. Until you put your trust in me, you're just slaves. And the thing about, about this is that once you're free from slavery, why would you ever go back? There's a, a film called 12 Years a Slave. It was out a few years ago. I, I, I wouldn't say I recommend it because it's grueling. But it does demonstrate very clearly the horrors of slavery and the joy of being set free, which the central character is, eventually, after 12 years. And it's a true story. And of course, he never ever went back to slavery. Why would you, once you're free, go back? It's unthinkable. And yet, the unthinkable was happening in Galatia. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. And those weak and worthless elementary principles is that worldwide illusion we've already described, which is that we can somehow justify ourselves. We can somehow put ourselves right with God if we think of God at all, or else we can somehow make our own way in the world. It can't be done. It can't be done by doing good works or by being extra religious. It's weak and worthless because it doesn't work. It's a direct path back to slavery. So, Paul was urging them, stay free, stay free. And let's hear that plea ourselves now here in the 21st century, <clears throat> where the issues may be very different, but where the plea is the same. Stay free. Don't let yourself be enslaved again by anybody else, or by yourself. Because you see, there is that innate tendency in human nature to want to do things for myself. To want to earn brownie points. We'll come on to that a bit later on. I might even think that somehow I was kind of, um, you know, making myself acceptable to God by coming to church this morning. What a mistake. No, we don't um, make ourselves acceptable by coming to church. We come to church because we've already been made acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We come to confess our sins. We come to praise him. But we don't come to earn his favor. That's slavery. Well, the Jerusalem group were not only demanding that the Galatians be circumcised if they were men, but he was also start, they were also starting to impose all the Jewish ceremonies. We see this 
in what Paul goes on to say. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. You see, they were saying, now, well, the Sabbath, you've got to keep that, of course. And then there's Passover, yep, yep. And then there's Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths, and there's this and that, and the Feast of the New Moon, and it goes on and on and on. There's no end to it. Once you're a slave, there's no end to the demands that are made upon you. No wonder Paul was so horrified. No wonder he pleads with them. This wasn't just some abstract religious disagreement. The Galatians were in danger of throwing away their freedom in Christ. And Paul took it personally. He took it very personally. And so he now moves on to the second part of his plea. The first part was stay free. The second part is stay faithful. You see, if we start to add the law to faith, what does it mean? Had Paul been wasting his time telling the Galatians about Jesus, if all the time they were going to go back and become Jews anyway, was he wasting his time? As we'll see, he worked very hard indeed with them. He'd suffered a great deal to take the gospel to them. So he had every right to plead with them and to hold himself up as an example to them. He had given up all his Jewish privileges. Do you remember? He says they're all, slightly rude word, all those Jewish privileges are all just, you know, rubbish, let's say, to use a polite expression. They're just, he just got rid of them all because they counted for nothing in the sight of God. And so he says, you know, Look, look, this is what freedom looks like. Um, don't turn away from me because I'm here. I've been given to you as an example to show that his faith was in Jesus Christ alone. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. And now he comes on to describe what the original encounter was like when he first took the gospel to them. And they, they wel welcomed the gospel and they welcomed him with great joy and they welcomed his message. And we discover that uh, it was some affliction that led Paul to Galatia. Paul was very busy, as you know, if you've ever looked at a map in the back of your Bibles of the uh, missionary journeys he went on. You know, he was on the move the whole time. And yet he had to stay in Galatia for quite a period of time, which is why there were several Christian communities that had sprung up, because he was ill. He was unwell. Obviously, God must have arranged it that way. He had a physical weakness, but they didn't despise him. It's very touching, really. They didn't judge him by outward appearance. And this was part of their acceptance of the gospel. You see, the gospel, at the center and the heart of the gospel, is a man on a cross. That's a pretty weak position to be in, isn't it? Nailed to a cross. And the messengers of the gospel can appear very weak. But it's the power of God to save, the only way we can be saved. So they received Paul, not just as some... Um, messenger from a faraway place. They, they received him as though he was like an angel, a messenger straight from God, straight from heaven, an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Yes, he was. Jesus has sent him direct and personally to the Galatians. Now, some people think that the problem may have been Paul's eyesight because he goes on to say, what then has become of the blessing you felt? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. It's a very, very moving testimony to the love that was there at first between Paul and the Galatians. He brought them this message of freedom, he was in a weak condition, and they longed to, to help him and respond 
um, if they could. They knew that his visit was a real blessing to them. They knew. So what had changed? What had changed since those early days? Well, of course, Paul knew what had changed. And now we know also. And he was deeply, deeply troubled about it. These Judaizers had arrived and had got to work busily undermining Paul's message and also undermining the messenger. And it, once again, it would have gone a bit like this. You know, that chap, Paul, well, he's a bit of an extremist, really, you know. He's a bit of a fundamentalist. You know, he, he, he's, he, he's, he's pretty exclusive. He's pretty offensive in what he says. You know, you don't want to offend people, do you? No, well, just keep, keep the law, keep Moses' law, and people will be quite happy with that. And you'll be very acceptable in society. You know, people will, will want to, um, to welcome you. I'm sure you're sensible people, you Galatians. I'm sure you'll agree. And Paul says, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't throw away your freedom. Stay faithful. He's pleading with them, not just, uh, not at all really for his own sake, but for their sake. Have I then become your enemy, he says, by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out. That you make much of them. There's such a lot going on here, isn't there? Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, they're clever people, these Judaizers, and they'll flatter you. They're flattering you. They're telling you that you can be very acceptable in society. All you've got to do is to keep the, the law of Moses, not only acceptable to God, but acceptable to other people. Um, they are telling you you can play a part in your salvation. That flatters human pride. We all like to think we've contributed something, don't we? Paul says, oh yes, it's very flattering, but it happens not to be true. I'm telling you the truth. Is that so bad? <laughs> yes, the Judaizers were adept at flattery, but at the expense of the truth of Paul's gospel. And the effect of their teaching, said Paul, was to shut the doors of the churches. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. Do you see how it was going? If they are keeping the, the whole law as a way of, of making themselves acceptable, they may as well shut down their Christian meetings. They're a waste of time. Just, just go to the synagogue. It was the whole future of the Christian church that was at stake, as well as the future of individual Christians. No wonder Paul was so desperate to turn them back to the gospel. And then, of course, once they all are in synagogues, who's going to be in charge? Who's going to lead those synagogues? It's going to be these highly impressive Judaizers from Jerusalem, isn't it? You see, that's how it goes. Paul's message uh, was very unflattering by contrast, as we've seen. He's saying, no, you can't, you can't contribute anything to your salvation. Jesus has done it. All other religions and faiths say, you must do this, do that, do, do, do. The gospel is, Jesus has done it. So you must choose between do, 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 or done. And do, do, do is the way of slavery. Well, we're coming to a conclusion. We're coming to an end. How agonizing this was for Paul. Look what he describes it to you. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. He says it's worse than giving birth. I don't know how he knew. <laughs> but I suppose he'd been told... And anyway, there were no anesthetics, were there, in those days? So, yeah, um, we, we see what he means. It's agonizing to bring forth mature Christian people who won't be swayed by misleading teaching. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. You see, these, 
These flatterers are all very friendly when they're with you, and then they push off and say, oh, you know, these poor, these poor Galatians, these poor ignorant Gentiles. Paul says, I love you whether I'm with you or whether I'm away. I care for you, I pray for you, I plead with you wherever I am in the world, whether I'm free, whether I'm in prison. I just want you to be free yourselves. We must stop. We must stop. Um, just to, to ap apply this second point, because you see this problem is still rife. It's still rife in Christian churches today. It's Jesus and this. It's Jesus and that. It's adding stuff to the gospel. It's taking away stuff from the gospel. But if you add to the gospel, you've lost it. If you subtract from the gospel, you've lost it. Either Jesus Christ has saved you or he has not. And my dear friends, I know you know he, he has, but just stay with it. Otherwise, you see, we may as well close the church. God forbid. Amen.